Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole and today we're going to talk about fluoride and how it may be impacting your child's development and behavior. Now, when most of us think of fluoride, we think of teeth and the dentist, right? I mean, after all, dentists have been telling us for years, fluoride is the key to keeping our teeth strong, preventing cavities for us and for our kids. And most of us in the United States have fluoride added to our water. We may use toothpaste with fluoride in it, other kinds of oral health products that we use regularly. And I have to admit that as a parent for years, I never really questioned or looked into whether fluoride was something my kids and I actually needed um, and, and didn't really research what the potential problems with fluoride could be. And it turns out that there are several concerns with fluoride exposure, and these issues go way beyond our teeth. So to help us dive into this and understand these issues and the history of how so many of us have gotten exposed to so much fluoride in the first place is Melissa Gallico. Let me tell you a little bit about Melissa. She's a former military intelligence officer, Fulbright scholar and intelligence specialist at the Federal Bureau of Investigation, where she instructed classes for FBI analysts at Quantico and provided analytic support for national security investigations. She's the author of The Hidden Cause of Acne and host of The Gallico Show, a podcast dedicated to exposing the pollution story behind artificial water fluoridation in the United States. Melissa graduated with honors from Georgetown University and has a master's degree from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. She is one of the most knowledgeable people out there on this topic, and it is such a pleasure to have her with us on the show here today. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, I'm reading your bio, super impressive. You've got this, you know, amazing background, but not in anything related to fluoride or health. And so I just have to, we have to start by hearing your story of how did you come to specialize in the topic of fluoride sensitivity given what your background is? Well, it certainly wasn't by choice. I'll tell you that I never set out to become, um, to develop an expertise in fluoride, but because of my job, I had the opportunity of living in a lot of different places. And for the last 25 years, I've moved probably once a year or once every two years. And a lot of that has been international travel. And I just, I always had cystic acne. And I noticed when I lived in certain countries, it just cleared up right away. And then I would come to the States even for a week and it would start, start back up again. And the dermatologists all told me, it's genetic, it's hormonal, or and they I tried all of the you know Accutane and different prescription drugs, and they did help, but I, I never was able to figure out the root cause. You know, why does it clear up in these other countries? Mm -hmm. And eventually, after about 20 years of having acne, I realized um, it was because of the fluoride in my diet. I had done my research and I knew that topical fluoride exposure, like toothpaste can cause kind of acne-like eruptions, but I never had seen any research about fluoride in your diet causing acne. So I just tested it out, you know, very simply stopped drinking fluoridated water and saw such a huge improvement that I, I knew I was onto something. So I just started researching, well, what else contains fluoride? And eventually I was able to clear my skin completely, no matter where I lived, even if there's a lot of fluoride in the water. And I thought this was maybe a weird allergy that I had or some kind of rare sensitivity. And I just wrote a little guide, a PDF guide. I put it online. It was free. And I said, if anybody has this other weird allergy, you know, it's, it's acne, but it clears up by avoiding fluoride. And I started hearing from so many people and I couldn't believe it because I was looking at the number of people downloading the guide. And I just thought this statistically, I shouldn't be hearing from this many people. Mm -hmm. And a woman sent me an email with the line, your, your book saved my life. And I just thought, oh my goodness, I have to write an actual book. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I turned it into a book. I put it on Amazon. Again, the reviews just added up people saying they had acne for 30 years and finally it's gone. And um, so a, a publisher came along and published it and now it's actually out there in the world. And that's how I came to be doing these interviews about fluoride. Um, it really disrupted my life, <laughs> but I'm very happy to be able to share this information with people because it's, it's not something that would be on your radar unless you had this experience of moving back and forth and happen to be an intelligence analyst and like figure out that it was the fluoride. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you really used your background in academics and, um, you know, sort of investigation and things to get to the root of your own health issue. And, and I think for so many people, um, 
you know, who specialized in some of these things related to health. It was a personal experience that brought them to that. But, you know, what you said about just the fact that you moved was really what allowed you to kind of test that out and see the difference. And I think for most of us, we stay in one place or in one general area or certainly within the same country. Um, and, and just, you know, whether it's fluoride or other things, it's just not on our radar to think about how that stuff, you know, may be impacting um, us. So I, I want to have you talk about why should we be concerned about fluoride? So you discovered that this was connected to your acne and since have discovered that it's connected to lots of things beyond um, acne, but why, why should we be concerned about this? I mean, we're told by dentists, we're told, you know, that the general mainstream idea, at least in this country is, this is very safe. You actually need to have exposure to this, you know, to keep your, your teeth healthy. So why should we be concerned? So like you mentioned, it, it's not just acne. That's how I happen to react to it. And in, in a very short amount of time, the reaction is within a few hours. So that's how I was able to piece it together. Like so confidently that this is it was very clear, you know, observing this reaction over years that that was the trigger. Um, but other people manifest um, reactions to fluoride in different ways. So um, I'm not the first person to discover <laughs> that fluoride causes acne. It's actually, I, I was reading later, um, there was a well-known allergist named George Waldbott, um, who in the 50s, soon after fluoridation was introduced, he observed all of these hypersensitivity, um, hypersensitive reactions to fluoride in people like me. And it wasn't just acne, it was also like hives or skin rashes, so other skin conditions, but some people developed gastrointestinal problems from fluoride. So they drink a glass of water and within a few hours they would have you know, digestive upset mm -hmm. or it's a trigger for migraines. A lot of people have noticed that and it's really, really hard to diagnose that because it's in the water, you know, you're drinking it every day and you just think, oh, I, I'm one of those people who gets migraines and you can't figure it out, but it's because of fluoride and it's so ubiquitous that it's just um, really difficult. Even a lot of um, migraine experts don't know that that can be a trigger. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's having reactions far beyond, you know, skin conditions. Um, other things besides that are um, affecting your endocrinological function. Mm -hmm. So depressing thyroid function, which throws a whole bunch of other things out of whack. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think you, you probably <laughs> covered that in a few episodes, but um, so that's why we should be concerned about it. It's not just acne and you know, you don't drink fluoride and it just goes to your teeth. It's going throughout your entire body and it can affect all of those systems. And on George Walbot, the one thing he said after you know, years and years of studying these hypersensitive reactions to fluoride is the only thing predictable about how someone will respond to fluoride is that it will be unpredictable. It, it could be like any different system. So that's um, why we should be concerned about it. Well, and you know, in, in preparing for this interview and actually in some writing I was doing a few months ago, I came across um, some research actually about fluoride exposure in children as it relates to cognitive functions um, and that overexposure to fluoride really can negatively impact children's development, their cognitive functioning, um, their attention, things like that. Um, and so, you know, there, there is some information out there about this in the research literature, but it, it certainly isn't getting widely promoted. I mean, we're not hearing about it unless we go and look for it, right? Right. That is the most concerning aspect to me is the neurotoxic effects of fluoride. And when we started fluoridation in the 1950s, they were not thinking about that at all. They were very, they were doing very rudimentary studies about, you know, if they drink fluoride, how many cavities do these children have? Mm -hmm. And they weren't thinking about how it affects other parts of the body. Um, really in two, 2012, there was a big meta-analysis from Harvard researchers, and they looked at all the research from all over the world about how fluoride is affecting the brain. And they concluded that there is, that fluoride is, is a neurotoxin that should be a high research priority um, for public health officials to look at how fluoride is affecting children. Um, and whenever they, they've done that, it, there's just so much bias within the public health community that this is good because we've been doing it for so long and it's just like kind of assumed at this point that any research that says fluoride isn't, well, that can't be right. You know, we've been doing it for so long and we're, we're all functioning, we're still here. Uh, but that's just how 
we've always done done things with toxins. You know, we think, oh, it's still such a small amount, it's not bad. And then decades and decades later, we learn that that small amount actually is really bad over a long period of time. Um, so there's research coming out on this. It seems like every month, a new study from a toxicologist. There was just um, one that came out um, in May from a toxicologist at the University of Washington, Stephen Gilbert, who's the founder of the Institute of Neurotoxicology and Neurological Disorders. And he says, numerous scientific studies finding harm from fluoridation started in the 1950s and have continued to accumulate to the present day. Discontinuing the practice is the prudent preventive measure to take. So mm -hmm. he, he is one of our leading toxicologists looking at this research saying um, that Fluoride not only affects IQ, but also influences ADHD, mm -hmm. um, which is, I know, something of a lot of concern to a lot of your, your listeners. Yeah. Um, there was a toxicologist. Dentists don't generally work with toxicologists. You know, they're very focused on teeth. Right. Um, but there was a, a center in Boston, Forsyth Dental Center, that hired the first toxicologist to work at a dental center in the 1990s, and a woman named Phyllis Mullenix. They recruited her from Harvard to run this center. And they said, why don't you start with fluoride? And she said, sure, why not? Uh, had no preconceptions about it being bad for you, but her animal studies very quickly show that fluoride cro crosses the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. And she found that when they were exposed, um, when they had prenatal exposure to fluoride, it resulted in hyperactivity. So like an ADHD type um, symptom. Whereas postnatal exposure to fluoride was hypoactivity, mm -hmm. so more like lethargy or like depressed thyroid function. Mm -hmm. So it really depended on when, um, when they were exposed, how they would react. And that's one of the things that makes it confusing. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we're seeing that with more and more toxins, as you mentioned, right? It's like whether we're talking about toxins that we get from things that are sprayed on our food or, you know, toxins from things um, in the environment around us or things like fluoride, the assumption unfortunately, at least in this country, is that these things are safe and less proven otherwise. And so we go through generations of being guinea pigs on, you know, exposure to these things before we really understand the potential dangers. And, you know, we've covered this on the show related to glyphosate and some other, you know, types of, of toxin exposures that really children are the canaries in the coal mine, you know, with these issues because their brains and their bodies are more fragile and vulnerable. They're in a phase of really fast development, um, you know, from a brain standpoint, from a, from a physical standpoint. And that makes um, many children more susceptible, especially from a neurological standpoint, to the effects of these kinds of toxins. Definitely. And, and one thing parents can do to see if their children have been overexposed to fluoride, and this depends, you know, on when the exposure occurred, but look at their teeth and you can see um, it's a condition called dental fluorosis, which mm. I have it, which kind of um, would help explain why I am hypersensitive to fluoride. But um, when children have too much fluoride, when their teeth are forming, they will develop, um, sometimes it's dark brown stains, but a lot of times it's, it's more subtle than that. You know, maybe it'll be white spots, white flecks on the tooth enamel, or like an opaque quality around the edges of the tooth. And that will show that during this time when these teeth were forming, your, your child was consuming too much fluoride. Mm -hmm. And that's agreed across the board. CDC um, mm -hmm. lowered the amount of fluoride in water a few years ago because the rates of dental fluorosis have just skyrocketed mm -hmm. um, since the 1980s. The latest study I saw was over 60% of children in the United States have some form of dental fluorosis, meaning they are getting too much fluoride. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy thing you can do is look at their teeth or ask, ask the dentist, you know, do you see any signs of dental fluorosis? Mm -hmm. And that's an indicator your child is getting too much fluoride. That's great, a very tangible, practical thing. What, what are some of the, the other common signs of fluoride toxicity in children? Are there others? Um, so dental fluorosis is, is the biggest one. Um, testing thyroid function is always, is always a good indicator. If you have like a low, low thyroid um, function, that's often tied with overexposure to fluoride. Um, it may be one of those things where, you know, just like with uh, so many other things we're exposed to, that it's almost like we have to do what you did, which is remove it for a period of time to see what the change is, right? So, you know, I, I can think about that 
um, you know, for parents who maybe are struggling with kids with, you know, symptoms of uh, ADHD or, you know, certain behavioral symptoms or learning issues or whatever, just to see what the change might be if they reduced exposure for a while, not unlike what you did, you know, with your acne traveling, you know, between different countries um, to see, so, see what the impact may be. Cause I think so often it's, it's hard to tell cause we're just so used to having this stuff. I mean, especially you think about like, it's in our tap water, um, you know, and we're constantly trying to get kids to drink more water. Um, but this is a potentially a problem if they have sensitivity to this or if they are getting too much of it having them drink tap water that's been fluoridated could be a problem for them. That's exactly what I recommend to people. Do a 30-day fluoride-free challenge. I have one on my um, website where I'll send like a little email every day showing you different ways that we're exposed to fluoride and how you can cut down on that and, and just see what the difference is in 30 days. Do you notice any difference in your digestion or in your skin or in how you feel in your mood? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mention that one, but mood is another very good indicator. Um, I have a whole chapter in my book about um, acne and depression, and they have found a very clear link between acne and depression. And a lot of people think it's because of, you know, you're so depressed that your skin looks bad, but it's much, much deeper than that because, you know, I was used to having acne and I always thought, oh, I just have acne. I'm so used to it. Um, but I, when I went back and looked at like, the periods in my life when I was the most depressed, it was always when there was the most fluoride in the water. And it was incredible how, how that it's like, I have a graph in my book, like here's my mood over the last 20 years. And it was perfectly correlated with the amount of fluoride I was being exposed to. And I never called it depression until later when I felt what it was like not to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, that's when I realized, like, I wasn't supposed to feel that way all of those years. I was supposed to feel like this, like just more mm -hmm. normal, you know, more stable. Um, so there is a very clear link between that. That's really interesting. And it's important to remember that in children, those mood or those depression issues often show up as irritability, agitated behavior, um, more of you know what we call behavior problems as opposed to what we typically think of depression symptoms you know, in adults. So um, yeah, really relevant to what a lot of our listeners are dealing with with their kids. So you know, th this begs the question, I mean, you know, we we're talking about drinking tap water and, and the ways that we're exposed to this, how did it come to be that in most parts of the U.S., and, and I think it is the, the vast majority of us, right, are, have um, public water supplies that have fluoride added to them? How did that come about? So over 70% of public water supplies in the United States are artificially fluoridated. Um, it's less than other, most other countries. Um, fluoridation is pretty much limited to the English speaking world, more or less of our partners that we've kind of passed this along to. Canada, I think it's a third. Um, Australia, New Zealand are pretty heavily fluoridated and parts of England as well. Ireland has a national mandate. All of Ireland is fluoridated. Um, and what I want to get across with this podcast series that I'm launching is that fluoridation is a pollution scandal. Mm. Our fluoridation was the leading form of air pollution throughout the 20th century, the number one form of air pollution, causing more litigation than the next 10 forms of air pollution combined. Wow. So it was just major lawsuits, especially after World War II, because we needed a lot of aluminum to build all those planes, and aluminum is the leading... Um, industry that pollutes uh, fluoride, but also a lot of other industries, coal, electric companies, um, fertilizer plants, all kinds of industries will put fluoride into the atmosphere because it's a common element in the Earth's crust. So they were being sued and they hired university researchers to defend them in court, create science that shows fluoride can't possibly be bad for you. Mm -hmm. And those researchers, that's what they did. They did all kinds of studies showing that, oh no, it's not bad for you, it's very safe. And these are the same researchers, the same exact researchers who were saying lead is perfectly safe. Let's put it in our gasoline. And they were saying DDT is perfectly safe. It was all the same lab mostly that worked for industry defending them against these lawsuits. So that's, um, and there's a lot of primary source historical evidence for this. If you look through the documentation, it's, it's clear that they were manipulating the science. This wasn't unbiased science. This is very, very one-sided science. And Unfortunately, they have a lot of leverage in the government and they have a lot of um, lobbying power and a lot of money. And 
scientists, very reputable scientists have been refuting this from the beginning, but they're just, they don't have the backing that they would need to do the big research studies um, to prove that fluoride is dangerous. So it, it really is a pollution scandal. Mm. Fascinating. And again, something that just isn't on our radar because it's not being talked about. Um, you know, I found it interesting. I was reading through some of your um, materials and one of the original places that was studied as far as fluoride in the water was Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where I live and where my clinic is. And, and I found that really interesting. Although, am I right? Did I read it right that that, that actually was never completed, the, the study well, on that? Well, that's a really interesting study. So that was like the first big government trial of fluoridation, government experiment. Let's put it in the water, see what happens. And if you go to the National Institute of Health website, they say, oh, it was a, it was a huge success. And, you know, H. Trenley Dean, the father of fluoridation, you know, did this big, big study. Um, but when you look at the documentation from that time period, just two months before he agreed to do that study, he was saying, we, we can't do this. This isn't safe. We haven't studied anything. We don't know how it affects anything other than teeth. There's all this evidence of harm. And they went ahead and did it anyway. And so he agreed to oversee it because they were doing it anyway. Um, it was like the public officials decided to do it. There was no public vote. It was just like a bunch of council members basically saying, let's put this in the water and, and see what happens. Um, so right before that, he's saying, this is a bad idea. But like once you do it, you can't really go back because mm -hmm. then people could sue you for having put this in the water. Mm -hmm. So he jumped on board and um, with it was supposed to be a 15 year study. Within five years, the government's like, hey, this is great. Let's all do it. So the control city, which is, I think a city called Muskegon. Does that sound familiar? Muskegon? Yep. Muskegon. Yep. Okay. Muskegon mm -hmm. was the control city. Yep. But when they endorsed fluoridation five years in, Muskegon was like, hey, let's put fluoride in our water too. So there's no control city to compare mm -hmm. to see if it even worked, to see if it even reduced cavities. Yep. And so the whole study was just shot from then on. And they never looked for any signs of, neg of harm. From mm -hmm. that, you know, they did just very, very basic um, physicals of school children. Mm -hmm. But what about the elderly? The elderly accumulate fluoride and develop all kinds of bone and joint disorders. That's mm -hmm. from fluoride. If you're experiencing arthritis or um, mm -hmm. pain, pain in your joint, that could very likely be an early stage of skeletal fluorosis, which mm -hmm. is another well documented side effect of uh, fluoride toxicity. So we basically did a study that ran for a third of the time it was supposed to, said, oh, great, this is working, let's put it everywhere, and then had no control group really to compare to to see what the problems might be. And of course, you know, um, so it became public policy now that it's in the tap water. And I know from just bringing my children to the dentist over the years that they always ask if you don't have city water, um, if you're connected to a well or whatever, then they want to give your child fluoride treatments, um, you know, in the dentist's office. So, so they're wanting, kids are getting fluoride, whether they're getting it from their water or they're getting it at the dentist, right? Right. And, and it's in so many things other than water too. So even children that aren't drinking fluoridated water are developing dental fluorosis because they're being exposed to it from so many other sources. Yeah, what, what are some of the other common um, sources? I mean, toothpaste, I know that you know most uh, commercially available toothpastes have fluoride in them. I had to search to you know, find some options. It's not easy to find options that don't have fluoride added to them, but what, what are some of the other common ways that kids are exposed? So anything made with fluoridated water can be high in fluoride. So all the you know, ready-made drinks, um, sodas, soft drinks, and a tea is a big one. Um, tea, like iced tea, tea happens to be the only plant that uptakes high amounts of fluoride from the soil naturally. So mm -hmm. I just measured, I bought a fluoride meter and I was measuring different types of tea and I made um, a glass of Lipton tea, just a normal black tea bag. And it was incredibly high in fluoride, 10 times what you'd find in fluoridated water. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. Um, even things that you wouldn't think contain fluoride, fluoridated water, like cereal, box breakfast cereal, if they make it with fluoridated water, that fluoride will concentrate in the cereal and it can be really high in fluoride. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're hypersensitive, I tell people, you know, make cereals at home using whole grains. That way you know what kind of water was used and it's less, less processed and uh, much healthier that way. And then it's 
also used as a pesticide, especially in this certain place of California where they grow all the raisins and they grow a lot of grapes and, and wine, which hopefully your, your child isn't drinking wine. <laughs> Not yet, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, right. But, um, but grape products, grape juice can be very high in fluoride because of that, because it's a pesticide. And that just is an indicator of how toxic fluoride is that they would use it as a pesticide. Well, I was um, just thinking yeah. that. I'm like, wow, like so many other toxins, like, oh, you know, we use it to kill bugs and other things, but oh, it's totally safe for us, right? Right. And it's, it's crazy because they admit that the, it's not like it's a different chemical. It, these, it, it's all fluoride. Um, even the fluoride added to the public water supply, it's not like a pharmaceutical grade fluoride. They buy it from phosphate fertilizer plants. And these plants, the same plants, they used to admit it into the atmosphere and they were being sued because the farmers that lived around the plant, all their animals were dying and were having all of these health effects. So they are no longer allowed to just stream fluoride pollution into the atmosphere like they did back when fluoridation first started. They have to collect that and it's considered a hazardous waste. It's very expensive to dispose of it but they actually sell it to our local water providers and they put it and they add it to the water supply. So if you call your local water provider and say, you know, I want to know where the fluoride that you're putting in the water comes from, or if you do you know, a Freedom of Information Act request to get that information, most likely it comes, it's hydrofluorosilicic acid from a phosphate fertilizer plant in Florida. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, this is just more of a reason to go back to some of the things that, that I talk about on the show often of eating more of a whole foods diet, not including more heavily processed foods in your diet, because here's another thing that can be, you know, in those foods. And again, while maybe a little bit here or there isn't a big deal, it's the buildup, right? So we've got it in our water that we're drinking. We've got it in our toothpaste that we're using twice a day. We've got it in um, cereals and certain foods that we're eating. And especially when we're thinking about small kids, that can build up quickly. You know, I, I think it's important to, to note that fluoride is something um, that is naturally occurring that we do need in very small amounts, right? And the, the issue is that now we've gotten overexposed. We're getting way more than what our body actually needs. Is that correct? Exactly. I, there's no research that says we need it. Like there's nothing, there's no side effects that develop when people don't have fluoride. But most foods have like a very, very trace amount and your body can handle that without any problem. But you're right, it bioaccumulates and it stays there for a very long time. Uh, the National Academy of Science estimates that the half-life of fluoride, which means you know, when you consume fluoride today and it's stored in your bones or your teeth or wherever your body stores it, half of that fluoride will still be in your bones 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. That's a very long half-life. So it's staying in our bodies, it's bioaccumulating, and we're just being exposed to so much of it that we, that we develop all of these uh, side effects. So, I mean, obviously reading labels becomes really important for this, like with so many other things, right? Like reading labels on personal care products, um, reading labels on, on food products and things. What about, are there ways to, um, sort of minimize exposure uh, like through the skin and things? I mean, I'm thinking about the fact that, okay, so I know that my water here at the clinic, at my home, um, you know, is, is city water that's fluoridated. The sensitivities like with acne and some of those other things, is that applicable through what's absorbed through the skin as well as what's ingested like through drinking it or is that a different, a different thing? It is, unfortunately, um, and some people are so sensitive that they can't wash their hands in it without getting a reaction. Um, I spoke with one woman, and her son has autism, he's very sensitive to, to fluoride, can't shower in it, has to have, she has a special filter on her shower. They don't really make shower filters for fluoride, but um, she has something kind of like DIY and just very short, cold showers, or else he'll start screaming whenever he is exposed to fluoride of any kind. So it really depends on the sensitivity level. Um, I can shower in fluoridated water and I'm okay. I don't like wash my face with it. You know, I'll use, I'll use bottled water to wash my face, but short, cooler showers and I'm okay. So I, it really varies, um, I guess, depending on your particular history, your particular sensitivity. Mm -hmm. But it is very hard to filter fluoride from the shower um, or from the bath, unless you have a whole house filter, which a lot of people can't do because mm -hmm. 
live in an apartment or they can't afford them because they're they can be expensive mm -hmm. um so it, it's really that's a really tricky one mm -hmm. yeah it's really hard to avoid so you talked about um sort of a 30-day um experiment to see what happens if you reduce exposure. Um, so aside from, you know, obviously looking at uh, your personal care products, so things like drinking um, tap water, what, what are some of the top things, you know, people can do if a parent's thinking, huh, this is kind of sounding like my kid, my kid's got sensitivity to so other things, like I wonder if this could be an issue. What, what would be, you know, one or two things that they could start, you know, trying right away? The first thing I always tell people is find a source of fluoride free water. Um, if you, and, and while you're doing that research, you know, you can usually contact the manufacturer and ask them, you know, if you're doing bottled water or, or finding a filter, um, distilled water is always fluoride free because of how it's processed. So that's one that you could just go today and get distilled water. You know, it's fluoride free. It might not be a long-term solution because it doesn't have the minerals that you would get in mineral water or in spring water, but right now like it's it's an easy um it's an easy uh, fix for some people and then um the toothpaste um if you go to a natural health food store or something they usually have a lot of fluoride free options those are the two biggest um sources of exposure for fluoride and then if you see a, a difference then you can fine tune it mm -hmm. and figuring out which foods to avoid and um one that that i didn't mention that some people are, are exposed to on a daily basis is pharmaceuticals. A lot of prescription pharmaceuticals contain fluoride because it will help deliver the drug to, you know, throughout the body. It's a way of um, helping with the systemic exposure of the drug. So it's in a ton of very popular pharmaceuticals like Prozac and Paxil and mm -hmm. all kinds of um, antibiotics and things. So that's another one um, you could look on Wikipedia and see if there's like an F in the, in the mm -hmm. chemical elements for the drug. And, and if so, maybe talk to your doctor about um, switching to something that doesn't have fluoride in it because that can be one that really throws things out. Mm -hmm. things off. But those yeah. are, I think, are the biggest like daily mm -hmm. um, exposures to fluoride. I, I love that, that people can start with, you know, looking at the water and the toothpaste, and then if that seems to be making a difference, go from there. Such, such practical, um, helpful information for people. You know, you've got um, your book, uh, The Hidden Cause of Acne, and then you also um, have this uh, very cool little graphic um, book that you put together, <laughs> F is for Fluoride, um, which I found very informative and helpful even as an adult. Um, <laughs> So I, I want to make sure that you share with our listeners, where can they go to find these resources? Where can they find you online? Because you've got a ton of really helpful information for people online. Where's the best place for them to go? Uh, so my book is called The Hidden Cause of Acne. And, um, and the website for that is hiddencauseofacne.com. And that's where you could go if you wanted to take the challenge, um, the 30-day challenge to go fluoride-free. Um, and there's a lot of information there, um, not just about acne, but fluoride sensitivity in general. And then I also have a Facebook group, a private Facebook group for people who are fluoride sensitive or just want to figure out a way to get it out of their water supply. Um, that's called Fluoride Free Faces. Um, if you do the challenge, I think there's a link somewhere in there that will take you to the, to the group where you could just find it on Facebook. And that's really helpful because there's hundreds of people from all over the world who have been dealing with fluoride sensitivity in one way or another. And by combining all of our experiences, we've really learned a lot about this, um, about this condition, which isn't very well documented in the mainstream literature. Um, so that's another resource. And then um, the podcast, I, I'm working on it. I, I've launched one episode, but I'll be putting some more out. And that's more about the pollution history. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and eventually, I'm going to switch into the how, how that's affecting our health. So bringing different um, health experts on to talk specifically about how it's affecting our thyroid, how it's affecting our bones. And I, I want to do a study about or an episode about the neurotoxicity, because that is a really important part of this whole picture. Absolutely. Great resources. Thank you for um, being a champion for this issue. Uh, the more I learn about it, the more I realize that we should be talking about it and thinking about it more. So thank you so much for spending time with us today um, and sharing all of this very valuable information um, with our listeners. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right, everybody, that does it for this episode of the Better Behavior Show. We will see you back here next time.